Good morning, Eastgate. We got a couple people out there. Good morning, Eastgate. <laughs> we're excited that you came in today and joined us, and we're excited to see everybody online. Wave at them. Let's uh, stand as we worship together this morning. Is 
Good morning. Thank everybody for joining us this morning. I want to first off just speak a little bit about our food pantry, what's going on this week. This week we picked up over 2,000 pounds of food to stock our fridges and our freezers. We even had to go and get another freezer that somebody donated to the church. So praise God for that. We fed 47 people in just one week this week, one week out of the month. We fed 47 people, amen. And another thing, Celebrate Recovery relaunched, um, and um, last week they had seven, and this week they had 12. So we are seeing numerous people coming into our church seeking a need between food and spiritual need. And so we just need to praise God that we are helping people, and we are giving help to those who need it. So praise God. Thank you for your generosity. I want to first off thank everyone for joining us online this morning. Um, Obviously, tithes and offerings look a little different. For people in here, in-house, we have um, ushering plates at the back of the entrances for you to drop your offerings in. You can also give online, and I encourage you guys on Facebook. The link should pop up on your screen. It's going to be www.eastgatenaz.com backslash give. Also, online. If you're new with us and we have not gotten to meet you, I encourage you, you can come here and worship with us. But if you're unable to, um, please go online and fill out our Connect card. If you go online, it's going to be under Connect tab. And you can scroll down and fill that out for us so we can get in contact with you and uh, learn how we can pray for you and meet your spiritual needs. And with that being said, this morning we have something a little different going on. So I'd like uh, AJ to come on down and I'd like Andy and Sandy to come on down. To the front here. We're going to celebrate our graduates for 2020. It's a little late this year. Um, we hadn't been able to do it because we were doing online only services, but this, this time now we get to do it. And um, this is actually AJ's last week with us before he leaves and go to, goes to Bridgewater College. A little bit about AJ. He graduated from Salem High School with uh, honors, so he's a little smart. And uh, <laughs> He will be attending Bridgewater College, and he will be studying business administration while also playing lacrosse there for Bridgewater. And um, I've only been his youth pastor for a little over a year, um, but I can tell he's got a heart of gold, and he's, he's ready for college. And so we just wanted to celebrate him this morning. Here you go. Please stay up here. Don't go anywhere. And Andy and Sandy, I wanted to give you this card. Um, in remembrance of Kenzie, who graduated from Lord Botetot High School this year. Um, she is not able to be here with us. She um, had a tragic accident, but we do, we want to remember her this morning because she accomplished so much in her life. She accomplished so much. And um, many of you know we redid our youth room um, this year, and uh, we made shadow boxes for our local high school jerseys. And so the first jersey to be hung on the wall is going to be one of Kenzie's track jerseys in remembrance of Kenzie here at the church. And so everybody give a round of applause. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask the family to come join us as um, I ask Pastor Shannon to come and pray over these families and pray over AJ as he's leaving for college and pray over the buyers this morning. So family, please come. Andy wants to say something. On behalf of Kenzie... I'd like to thank our church family, Pastor Shannon, Pastor George, Caleb, that you've been a blessing to her, and my family over these past few weeks. And uh, her good works are going to continue on in heaven, even though she's not here. We know she's going to carry on in heaven. And take heart, young people. Your good works here on earth will continue on in heaven too, Amen. forever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for those kind words, Andy and. Um, you're exactly right. God's called all of us to leave a legacy. And um, I can't tell you how proud I am of both of our graduates. Um, this past February marks 20 years since I've been here. Um, I came here under Pastor George's leadership as a student ministries pastor. Got to watch both of you guys be born <laughs> and to grow up in the church. And I think it's one of the greatest blessings you can ever have. You have a great legacy of parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. Think of Pastor Paul, who went on before us, who led this church well for years. And the legacy that stands here. Andy is saying, even though Kenzie's not here, you're here. And that reminds us that God's not finished with us yet. God has a plan in all things. 
And I just want to read Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to you today, and it reads this way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. You see, our job is simply to trust God. We don't understand the things of this world. We don't understand all the things that are going on around us. There's a spiritual warfare constantly going on around us. It says, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. And this is God's promise to us. God said, if you trust me, I will make your path straight. He said, you don't have to understand all things. You just have to know me because I know all things. Mom and Dad, I, I can only imagine standing there with your baby getting ready to go off to college. The range of emotions. But God has a plan, and He has a purpose for your life, AJ. And there's a few verses before in Proverbs I want to read to you today that I wasn't going to read, but I think it's very fitting. And AJ, I take, pray that you take this to heart and all of our young people that are here. It says, my son, do not forget my teachings, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years, not just life here, but eternal life, and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And here's the promise. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. That you see, God tells us that we are to take His Word and to hide it in our heart. And when God's Word is hidden in our heart and it's written on the tablets of our heart, the Scripture says, then you will be able to trust the Lord with all your heart. That you're not going to lean on your own understanding when you have questions and temptations and things come your way. We don't have to have all the answers, but we trust God. Why? Because we believe in His Word. And then we acknowledge Him by the way we live our lives. And that's what makes our path straight. So to this morning, I want to say congratulations for the hard work that's been put in. Get you to do this point in life. But remember, God has more. We recognize Kenzie's not here, but you are. God has more. You still have ministry to do. AJ, you're going off to college. It's not just to get a degree. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us that we're created in the image of God. And God told us in Genesis to be fruitful and multiply, and that means that God says, you know what, you're not created in the image of mom and dad, but you're created in the image of God, and your job is to take God with you to Bridgewater College. You have a, you have a mission field there. God's not finished with you. So this morning as we pray, we want to pray over these families that stand here and thank God for the life He's given us, but also for the calling He has placed upon our lives. Let's pray with these families today. Dear Heavenly Father, as I move across this altar and I lay hands on AJ, Father, I thank You for this young man, the man that he's become and the man that he's going to be. Lord, I thank You, Father God, for the calling that You placed upon his life, Father God, many years ago to come to You and know You as Lord and Savior. And Lord, that's very, very evident in his life. Lord, I pray, Father God, that as he trusts you, as he places his faith in you, as he walks in paths of righteousness, Lord, that you will lead him according to your name, according to your will and your way. Lord, I pray that your hand of blessing would be upon him. Lord, I pray for mom and dad and the family that's represented here today. Lord, we know that they're excited for him, Lord, but there's also, Lord, this, it's hard seeing your baby go off to college. Lord, but he's not going alone. Lord, I thank you for the investment that they've placed upon AJ's life. Lord, the way they've pointed him to Jesus. Lord, I pray your blessing upon this whole family, Lord, and I thank you, Lord. I thank you for what you're going to do, Jesus. And Lord, as I move across this altar, Father God, we're here to remember Kenzie today. Lord, we remember her life. Lord, the people that she's touched. And Lord, we recognize, Father God, that when you give us life, Lord, our life is meant to touch others, to shape them and mold them. And Father God, even though Kenzie's not here today, 
Lord, she has a legacy that lives on. And Father God, the way she touched their lives and molded and shaped their lives, Father God, makes us want to know you more. And Father God, we're reminded today, Lord, you still have work for us to do. And Lord, we're going to keep on keeping on with you, Jesus. But Father God, we recognize this world and this earth is short. But Father God, you called us to an eternity with you. And Father God, because of that today, we will praise your name. For you are holy, you are faithful, and you are our God. And Lord, today we just want to tell you that we love you and we praise you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand start to fall All those lonely roads that I've traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground friends I had were nowhere to be found. I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus. For this man who needs amazing kind of grace, a forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay. I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been. the alleys there was Jesus Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Matt and Denise. I appreciate you all singing that song so much. And, um, you know, in life, when things are hard, we look up and we see there's Jesus. That He's always there with us. No matter where we're at, what we're going through in life, we can always count on Jesus being right there by our side. You know, I, I, I want you to think for just a moment about all the many blessings in your life. You know, sometimes we, we see all the hard things, but we forget the blessings. You know, I, I, first of all, I want to start off by uh, thanking several people before I even preach this morning. I'm very thankful to be behind the pulpit this week, and um, for the last two weeks, I want to thank Pastor George for preaching. You ministered to me, to all of us, in a great way. Um, I thank you for your love. And your faithfulness. You know, we have four funerals this week. Thursday, Pastor Greg did a great job here. We were on the road, my family and I, to my wife's grandfather's funeral on Friday. And Greg uh, did a great job here with George Kelsey's funeral. And I thank you for that, Greg. John, we continue to pray for you and your family. And I thank you for the investment that you placed in George. Then Friday, we're at our, my wife's grandfather's funeral. Then yesterday, we were back, and yesterday, Mike Rudd's son's funeral was yesterday. And then I left, uh, I was there at Whitey's funeral yesterday, and Lisa, I'm so glad to see you and your family here today. And you know, one of the first people I walked into the funeral home and I saw was actually Mike Rudd and Becky walking in. They left his son's funeral and was right there with your family. That says so much to me yesterday when I walked in and just saw the love of this church. Then I left the funeral home and came back here to Eastgate to see all of you ladies working so hard. What a blessing, the, the meal that you all put together. We are a blessed people, church. To see the love and the care, and then as Caleb told you, we actually fed 49 people Wednesday was the exact number. I asked Greg a little bit earlier. There was 2,765 pounds of food that came in Tuesday. And to see the people here at the church working, and uh, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at um, Kara and Caden and then Hunter, and I don't remember who all was here. Um, Tuesday, there's a big group of kids and adults here that helped put all that food away. And then Wednesday, we have another group that comes in and uh, that has been helping every week to continue to feed people and Melissa, I thank you for all of your hard work, and Greg for putting all this together, that you know what, in the midst of everything going on, our church is feeding people, helping people recover from hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Every Wednesday we have Zoom meetings, our men's ministries meeting, our women's ministries meeting. Beginning of September, we're going to have Classes back here on Wednesday night, beginning September 2nd on Wednesday. We're still going to be on Zoom for those who can't be here. Amen. That is a huge prayer. Right, God, God deserves a hand for that. We, we need each other. We need fellowship. And, and, and we're seeing a lot of great things happen. And um, I just want to say before I even begin to preach this morning, thank you. Thank you to the church. Those who are here in person and those who are online, we want to say thank you for your faithfulness. You've been faithful in giving but faithful and loving people, and I, and I can't begin to tell you with, from my family's perspective, thank you for all the cards, the phone calls, but most importantly, the prayers. You know, I believe we need to be praying more now than we ever had in our history. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray for each other. And we need to pray for the church. You see, we, we begin this year of 2020 and... Um, we said this is going to be a year of vision, a year of focus. And a lot of people saying, Pastor, this has been anything but focus. This has been crazy and chaotic. And, and Pastor, this has been one of the worst years that we can ever think of the history of the world. But can I tell you something? It's not. And I want to tell you why, because it all really has to do with focus. And today we're going to talk about the glory of God and how God wants to change our focus, not from the things of this world, but to change our focus on Him. 
And I've been reading in uh, Isaiah, and I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 8 this morning, and that's going to be the, our sermon text this morning. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And the scripture begins reading like this. In the year that King Uzziah died. Now, I want to stop right here and just give you guys a little bit of meaning right here. Why in the world does Isaiah say in the year King Uzziah died? Well, you see, King Uzziah was actually a godly king. Israel had been a wicked people, and, and Isaiah was excited. They finally had a godly king. And all of a sudden, when this king died, Isaiah was heartbroken. And a lot of people were heartbroken because they said, you know what? King Uzziah is the one that we need. We need a godly king. We need a godly leader. And, and a lot of people were heartbroken. So Isaiah said, hey, it was in the year that King Uzziah died. He said, I felt heartbroken. But during that time, listen to what he says. I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. You see, they couldn't look upon the glory of God. It says, with two wings, they covered their face. With two they cover their feet. I want you to understand something. When we're in God's presence like we are this morning, I want you to understand something. When you walked into the sanctuary this morning, we literally walked into the presence of God, and with two wings they hit their feet. They recognized that when we are standing in the presence of God, that we are literally on holy ground. Now, they were flying with the other two wings, the Scripture says, but yet they were covering their feet. And they were calling to one another, holy Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of His glory. Now, I want you to stop right now for just a moment. Holy, 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 the Trinity of all Trinities. Isaiah is recognizing the Trinity of the Godhead, and he's saying God's glory is in the earth. Now, right here, King Uzziah has died. The people are in distress the people are in heartache and heartbreak. And he says this, I want you to understand something. Even things may look bad right now. He said, the glory of the Lord is full in the whole earth. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook and, filled the, temp and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am a ruined man, for I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah recognized that he was ungodly, that he wasn't a holy man, when he began to recognize that he was standing in the presence of God Almighty. He said, I'm living in a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew down, to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt, your sin is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Can I tell you something, church? We need the glory of the Lord to fall fresh upon us, to fall fresh upon our country now more than any other time in our history. I want to tell you something. We need revival. There's a lot of bad that's going on around us. As a matter of fact, if you look at Facebook, you see a lot of bad. As a matter of fact, we turn to Facebook and we see negative, negative, negative. Can I tell you something? And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Get off Facebook and get on the good book. This is the good news of the gospel. Amen. God deserves a hand clap this morning. Amen. Get off Facebook and you go, oh, Lord Jesus, it's bad. Guys, we have the living gospel at our dispense. The power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power we have today. And we come into church going, oh, pastor, it's hard. Yes, it's hard. 
Life is hard. Life's not always fair. But can I tell you something? God is still on the throne. Can I get an amen? It's time for the church to wake up. It's time for the church to be the church. It's time for us to see the glory of the Lord to fall down upon us, to fall upon His people. And it's time for the church to wake up and be a voice in a lost and dying world. I want to tell you something. We need revival. And regardless of a national or a regional revival or revival in our country or even a local revival, can I tell you something this morning? You can have personal revival. Revival in your life is not dependent upon your neighbor. I want you to hear me this morning. Revival in your own heart starts with you. You can't blame not having a a spirit of revival upon your wife or your children or your neighbor or your boss or the country or political party or president or group, a Republican or a Democrat. You know a revival starts at, it starts with me getting on my knees and saying, God, I recognize I need you. You see, a lot of people have lost hope. It seems their dreams and everything has died. And kind of this is the way Isaiah felt. He said King Uzziah has died and and he felt hopeless. He felt like there was no way to turn. A lot of people, you feel that your dreams and your hopes and your desires have died. You may be having a bad day, a bad week, a bad month. And for all of us here, 2020 has just simply been a bad year in a lot of ways. But I want to tell you something about bad circumstances. And I want you to hear me closely. When we go through hardships in life, never waste the pain, first of all. Bad circumstances gives us a clear view of who God is and how God can turn things around. The prophet of God had a fresh view of God that led to a personal revival, Isaiah had a true spiritual awakening. As a matter of fact, this was Isaiah's call as a prophet to do ministry. First, I want you to understand your outline. Number one is a revealing of God. God began to reveal himself to Isaiah. Isaiah, There's an unveiling, there's a revelation that he says, Isaiah, I want you to understand something. He said, I'm still God, and I'm still on the throne. He's saying, Isaiah, I want you to get your eyes off the things of this world. Isaiah, get your eyes off of your problems. Isaiah, place your eyes and place your faith upon me. Am I not still God? Am I still not in control? He said, Isaiah, I want you to see me. A in your outline said this. It was a fresh view of God. You see, it was a fresh view of God's sovereignty telling Isaiah that I'm in control. There's absolutely nothing that happens in this universe outside of God's influence and authority. I want to tell you something. God has complete authority over everything. I don't care what the enemy tells you. God is utterly in control. God has complete authority over over everything. He has authority over kings, lords. God has absolutely no limits at all. God is above all things and before all things. As a matter of fact, He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is immortal. He is ever-present. He's everywhere. And everyone can know God personally because of Jesus Christ. Revelation 21.6, He says, It is done. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. He said, anyone who wants to seek after me. He said, I don't care where you've been, what you've done. He said, I want to give you life. And God told us in the scripture, I don't want to just give you life, but I want to give you an abundant life. You see, God has created all things and He holds all things together, both in heaven and on earth. In Colossians 1, 6, it says, For in Him all things were created, in heaven and earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him for him. You see, God knows all things. He knows about our past. He knows about our present, where we're at right now. But he also knows the future that he holds for us. There's no limit to God's knowledge. For God knows everything completely, even before it happens. God is in control of all things. He has power and authority over nature, earthly kings, angels, demons. Satan himself has to come before God's presence and ask him permission before he can do anything. You see, all things created, all things in this world, all things in the heavenly realm answer to the authority of God. In Psalms 103, 19, it says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. So Isaiah has this fresh look at God as he looks into heaven and he sees him in the temple and he recognizes the authority of God and God shows him his sovereignty and says, Isaiah, he said, I'm in control. He goes, I want you to recognize that, Isaiah, where I am seated. Not only does he recognize where he is seated, not only does he recognize his authority and that God is in control, but being your outlier says this, he recognizes the holiness of God. In verses 2 or 3, it says, Above him were the seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying. And they were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of His glory. He's underscoring right now that He is the God above all things. His infinite holiness. He says, holy, holy, holy. He shows us that God is perfect in the Trinity. And the word holiness said right here says that God is separate and he's set apart from sin. God is eternally perfect. And Isaiah looks up. He says, the things on this world is not perfect, God. He said, but when I look into heaven, he said, and I gaze into your face, I realize you are a perfect, holy God. God is still on the throne today, church. Can I tell you that? No matter what's going on in your life, God is still on the throne. Heaven is over earth, and God has the last word, no matter how bad any situation may look. I don't know what you're going through right now. I know every single person in this room is going through something. And if you're not, it's coming. We're going to go through situations in life. Loss, hurts, all kinds of different things. And, and people are going to tell you sometimes, well, there's nothing that anybody can do. Things can't change. This is just the way it is. Can I tell you something? They're wrong. God has the ultimate authority over all things. We're to look to his face. An earthly king had died, and Isaiah realized that. But all of a sudden, he looked up and he saw the king of kings and the Lord of lords on the throne, and Isaiah began to realize something. I've seen God Almighty. And not only that, but then there, there was something he says here a little bit further in the scripture, and it talks about, he goes, I saw the Lord seated high on the throne, exalted. And he said this, the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, I want you to understand something. This has great significance. You say, oh, Pastor, what do you mean? I want you to understand something about the, the train of his robe. The train of a robe had great significance all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. You see, kings would wear these elaborate robes, and they were beautiful. And it would signify their majesty, but also their authority. As a matter of fact, a king with a long robe or a long train meant that that king had come back from battle, and he had won a major battle. After a king would defeat one army, he would go to that other king, and he would cut off a portion of that king's robe, and he would have it added to his robe, and it would be sewn together. And the longer his robe was, the more victories he had won. 
And, and so we begin to realize something about robes throughout the Bible. And I want to share a little bit about some of the robes in the Bible just very quickly with you this morning. In Exodus, you can read about God's direction on how the priestly robes were to be made for the Levites and how they were to wear them and serve them in the temple. Every portion of this robe that these Levites would wear had very deep meaning. I challenge you to write this down in your notes, maybe. Some of you guys want to go look it up this week. Go back to the book of Exodus and begin to look at what it meant for a Levite to wear one of these priestly robes. We look in Samuel, and Jonathan and David had made a covenant together. And all of a sudden, Jonathan, Saul's son, he takes off this robe and he gives it to David. He said, hey, I'm in covenant with you. In 1 Samuel, we see that David, um, he had been chased by Saul for a long time. You know the story, many of you do, that Saul had become the king. He had turned to wickedness. God had taken his hand off of Saul. He had gone to Jesse, and we talked about this a few weeks ago. He had gone to Jesse and said, Jesse, I, the prophet had come to Jesse, and he said, Jesse, because I, I've come by God to anoint one of your boys the next king of Israel. And all the boys had come through, and he said, do you have any more boys? And he said, just David, the young shepherd boy. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, how the anointing of God had been placed upon David. Now, David had not yet become the king, although the anointing of God had been placed upon him. And David still recognized Saul's authority as the king at this time. Even though Saul was chasing him, he was trying to kill him. David knew that he was to be the next king of Israel. And, and Saul goes into this cave, and he's actually, you know, it's kind of funny. He's got it going out because he's got to use the bathroom. And he's looking for David everywhere, and he doesn't realize it. And David sneaks up behind him, and he cuts a portion off of his robe saying, Hey, I could have killed you. But it wasn't just that. He humiliated Saul because he also said, Saul, I'm taking your authority. But can I tell you something? All of a sudden, David felt in a staring in his heart from God that he knew what I did was wrong. He realized that God, even though I'm anointed king, that my time hasn't come yet. And he came out there and he humbly went before Saul and he apologized. Can I tell you something? Even though we know God's called us to do something or something's going to happen in our life, we still have to wait upon God's timing and humility. You see, David understood that. Esther, God had placed her in a place to save his people. And the scripture tells us that she fearfully approached the king and begged of the king when she put on her royal robes. Job, when he had found out about his family and all the destruction and everything that happened, Scripture says he tore his robe and he went into mourning. Ezekiel talked about the stripping off of all the robes and laying them aside as a symbol of humbling and submission. And Matthew, the Roman guards, they placed a scarlet robe upon Jesus. They mocked him. And Luke, the prodigal son, comes home. Immediately his dad said, hey, put a ring on his finger. And give him one of the finest robes, symbolizing the authority as a son. And we look at the book of Revelation and all the saints, they're wearing robes of pure white, signifying the righteousness of God through the blood of Jesus. And then I'm going to tell you, one of my favorites comes out of Mark chapter 5 and verses 24 through 34. And I'm not going to talk a lot about this this week because I'm actually going to be preaching on it. Next week. But there's a woman with an issue of blood. She had been bleeding for years. She had spent everything she had and gone to all the doctors and she couldn't find the cure, but she heard Jesus was coming through. And she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just go to his robe and I could touch the hem of his garment, she goes, I believe I will be healed. She had faith in Jesus. She had heard about the miracles. She knew all the things that Jesus could do and She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'm not going to preach too much on this this morning, but on the hem of his garment, on the four corners, there would be these tassels and these knots tied, and they all stood for the laws of the Old Testament. And the hem of his garment, she said, if I could just grab a hold of those tassels, which she was saying, if I could grab a hold of the authority of God that rests upon this man, 
So I don't think she recognized exactly who Jesus was, but she recognized him as a man of God. She didn't recognize that he was really God in the flesh at this time, but she recognized the authority of Jesus Christ, and she said, if I could just get a hold of the hem of his garment, she said, I'll be healed. And I want to tell you something in that scripture, and I don't want to get too much in it today, but as she grabbed the hold of the hem of his garment, all of a sudden she was healed. And Jesus said this to his disciples, Who touched me? Who touched me, he said. There's some of you today that need to reach out, and you need to grab the hold of the authority of God, the healing of God, and you need to grab a hold of the hem of his garment, God's authority, and say, God, I need a touch from you. His disciples looked at him like they were crazy. Lord, don't you see the crowds pressing around you? There's thousands of people. There's hundreds of people around you. Everybody's touching you. He said, but I felt power come out of me. He said, the Father has worked a miracle right here in your presence. And you didn't even see it. You know why? Because you didn't have the faith. But this lady, she came and she touched the hem of my garment. You see, there's power in the hem of his garment. Why? Because the authority of Christ. And he's sitting in the temple. Isaiah understood this because he understood what the robe meant. This long train. He goes, I want you to understand. He said he had so much power. God has so much authority that everything is under him. He goes, he had the hem of his robe. He goes, the train of his robe filled the entire temple. Can I tell you something? God has authority over everything that you're facing today. Can I get an amen? I don't know about you, but the church needs to come to life. There's a lost and dying world out here that needs Jesus, and we're still sitting in our seats being quiet. I'm going to tell you what, I'm so thankful that we can have Facebook online, but if you're online and you can be in church, be in church. I don't care if we have to run two services, three services, four services, whatever we have to do to socially distance, but there's people that need Jesus. And we stand on the authority of God's Word that brings healing and salvation to people. And this is what Isaiah said. He goes, I don't care how bad the world looks, my God is a holy God, and He's still on the throne. And Isaiah said, there's nothing that my God can't do. He goes, Isaiah said, I had to have an eye check. He said, my focus was in the wrong place. He said, I was looking at all the bad around me. He said, but when I looked up into the heaven, I had a fresh look at the sovereignty of the power of God. He said, I saw His holiness, and it filled the temple. I saw His authority. And he said, you know what? Woe unto me. I'm a sinful man. Isaiah said, God, you're in total control. God, you're limitless. The scripture tells us he's an omnipotent God. He's all powerful. There's nothing he can't do. He's an omnipresent God. Wherever you're at, not just in this sanctuary, if you're online right now, if you're at work, wherever you may be, he goes, I'm all present. I'm everywhere all the time. And not only that, he goes, I'm omniscient and I'm all-knowing. When, the, when, 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 the, when all the doctors, when all the intelligent people, when all the professionals, all the experts say there's no way, you just look at them and smile and say, my God, there's always a way. My God is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere. He can do anything. That's the God we serve. Number two is the revelation of sin. You see, when we look at the holiness of God, we see our sin is evident. See, when Isaiah looked up, he said, Woe unto me, for I'm a sinful man, he said. As a matter of fact, I want to read it in Scripture, in verse 5. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined. Isaiah said, I'm worthless. I'm sinful. He said, God, I deserve hell. He said, I'm a sinful man. He said, for I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. But praise God for the second part. And my eyes have seen the King Almighty. But God says, Isaiah, I'm not finished with you. He said, you recognize your sin. You recognize I'm a holy God. He said, and you recognize I'm the one who saves. 
And he sent one of the seraphim to the altar. I don't know about you, but I thank God for the altar. Every church needs an altar where people can come in the presence of an almighty God and they can go before God and they can find healing and salvation. And he said he took one of those coals, those hot burning coals, the living word of God, and he touched my lips. He purified me. And not only purified me, then he called me. He goes, who will I send? And Isaiah said, woe unto me. I'm no longer a ruined man, but I'm a healed man, for I've been touched by a holy God, and my sin has been forgiven. I don't know about you, but I say amen. Once God has forgiven us, then he sends us out. He said, who will go for me? Isaiah said, sign me up, baby, I'm here. I don't know about you, but I say thank you, God, for your calling that you placed upon my life. And Isaiah said, I'm a ruined man, but now I'm a touched man, I'm a blessed man. He understood that. This wasn't just in the Old Testament church. I want you to understand this in the New Testament. We preached about this last year out of Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. It says, one day as Jesus was standing on the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little bit further from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When they had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. We talked about this last, last September. Simon's going, Lord, uh, you're a great teacher. This makes no sense. I recognize your authority as a teacher and, and, and I appreciate you. He goes, but I'm a professional fisherman. Aren't you glad when the professionals are wrong? Lord, we fish at night, not during the day. And we've just finished cleaning our nets, and this is long, gruesome, and tiring. And, and, and fish are not in the deep water, especially in the day. As a matter of fact, we're near shore fishermen, and we fish at night when we can see the fish scales. And uh, uh, Lord, I, I don't want to have to explain all this to you because you wouldn't quite get it because you're just a preacher. You're not a fisherman. But I love what he says. Let out into the deep. And let down your nets for a catch. Simon said, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. I love this. And if we could catch this right here, it would radically change our lives. But because you say so, Lord, it doesn't make sense to me. God, this, 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 this doesn't make sense to anybody else. All the other fishermen are going to laugh at me. Peter is such a bad fisherman, he's taking advice from a preacher. He can't catch any fish. What is he thinking? But Lord, because you say so, don't listen to the so-called experts. They are not the ultimate authority. Many times, they get it wrong. Lord, because you say so, I will do it. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. God said, I don't, I'm just going to bless you. I'm going to bless your socks off. All of a sudden, their nets began to break. They signaled for their partners to come and to help them. And they came and they filled their boats so full. Listen to this, the blessing of God. They were so full of the blessing, their boats began to sink. God said, I'm not just going to show up. I'm going to show up and show off. He goes, I'm going to show those so-called experts that I still have authority. When Simon saw this, I want you to look at this, the same thing as Isaiah. Simon fell on his knees and said, go away from me, Lord. Simon recognized he was a sinful man. He was standing in the presence of a holy God. Go away from me, Lord. I'm sinful. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the great fish they had taken. Also were James and John, the son of Zebedee's his partner. Aren't you glad that Jesus don't leave us, leave us there to say, I'm a sinful man? 
Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, for now you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up to the shore. Listen to this. They left everything and followed him. Peter went from being a guy who was taking advice from a preacher that didn't know what he was doing to become one of the greatest fishing legends in the world. And he left it all behind that day. Lord, I will follow you. You see, when everything else is going on around us, we stop looking at our circumstances. And we look to God, we realize that we serve a holy God. I can look at somebody else and say, well, I'm better than him or her. and feel good about myself. Pride always comes before a fall. But you see, my holiness is not dependent upon me looking at somebody else. Because when I see myself in comparison to God, I realize how much I need Him. God, that you've called me to live a holy life set apart. You see, Isaiah saw that when he saw God. Peter immediately recognized as he fell on his knees before holy God, God, I need you. He recognized his sin, his personal sin. You see, when we recognize Christ for who he is, we recognize our sinful self. Can I tell you something, church? We need the presence of God in our life, in our home, in our church, in our work, in our country, in every single area of our life. Number three in your outlines, the redemption of God. If you ever memorize one verse, memorize this verse. Ephesians 1.7 In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Can I tell you something, church? We need personal revival. We're only saved by God's grace. I want you to take a look at yourself right now. And ask yourself this. Am I living as a redeemed person? Am I living as a holy person? I'm not talking about how you look compared to somebody else on Facebook. Or somebody else that you work with. Or somebody else that calls him a Christian. When you look at yourself in comparison to God Almighty, ask yourself, God, am I living according to your standard? Not the standard of the world or people. Not the standard of American Christians. But the standard of your word. Lastly, not only are we, just re- are we redeemed by God through Jesus Christ's death on the cross, but there's also restoration. God also wants to restore us. No matter what we've done, where we've been, or where we're at. Last week, uh, Pastor George preached an awesome message on influence. He talked about Stephen. <clears throat> In the book of Acts, we... We see where Stephen was a faithful man of God. He lived in righteousness and holiness. And Stephen was there witnessing to people. And they got angry with Stephen. And the religious leaders did. As Pastor George preached so great last week, they began to stone Stephen. And right before Stephen died, Pastor George talked about it last week, how he said, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. But there's also something else in that passage of Scripture. It said his face became like the face of an angel. They begin to recognize the glory of God upon Stephen. You see, God's grace and his glory had fallen upon Stephen in such a way, I don't believe Stephen even felt the stones. I believe he was so overwhelmed by the grace of God that he was in such the presence of God. 
But God's glory had fallen upon him. He just knew he was right in the center of God's will. And as he took his last breath here, he took his first breath in the presence of God. And as Pastor George talked about last week so eloquently, there was a young man named Saul there who had signed papers that had thrown his coat down, his robe, signifying the robe, his authority. He says, I have authority. I come to have this man stoned. He cast his coat down. He said, I'm coming with my authority, saying, this is okay, I'm in agreement. Now Saul left there, we, we, we hear in Acts chapter 9, I'm going to read these verses right now. In Acts chapter 9 it says, Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone on the way that was belonging, whether men or women, that he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Now I want you to understand something. Saul saw the presence of God, this light. All of a sudden this light flashed around him. Listen to this. He fell on the ground and heard the voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Can I tell you something, church? When we truly enter the presence of God, we must fall upon our faces and our knees before Him and recognize our sinful self. Isaiah recognized the presence of God and said, God, I'm a sinful man. Woe unto me. Peter said, God, forgive me. I'm a sinful man. I can't be in your presence like I am. Saul saw the presence of God in such a bright light he couldn't see. He falls before him. And the voice of God says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And listen to Saul. He goes, who are you, Lord? I don't even understand who you are. Listen to what he said. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. I want you to understand there's power in the name of Jesus. Jesus was 100% God in the flesh walking on this earth. He goes, I am God. I am Jesus. I'm part of the Trinity of the Holy, Holy, Holy. He said, and why are you persecuting me? He replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Now I want you to understand something. Saul had the opportunity not to do this. But Saul recognized the authority of God. Then the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground. When he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. They led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there's a disciple there named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarshish named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen the man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your people, holy people in Jerusalem. Wait a second, God, Ananias says. Lord, I've heard about this man. You want me to go lay hands on him? Sometimes God asks us to do things that's way out of our comfort zone, that's way out of our understanding. He said, Ananias, this is what I've told you to do. Ananias says, he's come with authority from the chief priest to arrest everybody who calls in your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. Now, I want you to understand something. Ananias had to say, am I going to listen to the authority of men who may arrest me? Or am I going to listen to the authority of God who told me to go? Ananias got up and he went. Listen to what God says. This man is my chosen instrument. 
Ooh. Think about that for a moment. Saul, who had been persecuting the church, who had laid down his robe, given authority to have Stephen stoned to death, God said, this man is an instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles. He goes, I'm not finished with him, that I have the ability to forgive and restore him. He said, I want you to go to him, for he will proclaim my name to the Gentiles, to their kings, and to the people of Israel. I want you to understand something. He goes, he is called by my authority. He has been forgiven by me. And he recognized me on the road to Damascus when I called out to him and blinded him. Can I tell you something? When we come into the presence of God, we have to make a decision. Isaiah had to make a decision. Am I going to recognize myself as a sinful man and seek forgiveness and answer the call that God has placed upon my life? Isaiah said, Lord, I will go. Send me. Peter fell on his face before God. And he recognized the authority of God and said, God, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. He goes, oh, no, Peter. I've called you to be a fisherman of men who became one of the 12 disciples. Upon my rock, I'll build my church. Peter, I'm calling you. Peter said, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. I'll be your disciple. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go. You will be my instrument, Saul. You will be the one that I use, that I'll change your name to Paul, and you're going to write over half the New Testament. Can I get an amen this morning? You may feel like that your world is falling down around you, but can I tell you what? Your God is still on the throne working all around you. I don't care what the experts say that our country is going to hell in a handbasket. And the experts are saying all things are bad. Oh, it's so bad. We're wringing our hands. Oh, there's no Christians left. Everybody's leaving the church. That's a lie straight from the pits of hell. God's still on the throne saving people. Just two Thursdays ago, one of the guys that has never walked foot in their church, but has been witnessed to by Herrick for a long time, a guy by the name of Jason Burnett. He's been coming to our men's meetings for quite a while because Herrick's had an influence on his life. And just last Thursday, after one of the men's group meetings on Wednesday night, Jason gave his life to Christ. He doesn't even live in our town, not in the area. But you know what? God still uses social media and different things to save souls. There's some people in here this morning right now that you feel broken and you're saying, you know what, God? I'm unworthy, God. When I look into the heavens and I see your glory, I recognize I'm a sinful man. Don't stay where you're at. Jesus is saying, come just as you are. It's his call to you this morning. He's saying, don't stay where you're at. But come. He said, you might not be holy. You may not be righteous, but I am. He said, I'm the one who forgives sin. He said, I'm the one who washes you as white as snow. I don't care where you've been or what you've done. God is still in control. This morning, maybe you need a fresh touch from God. Maybe you need a fresh anointing. You need a fresh view of God. Can I tell you something right now? We're in the biggest time of spiritual warfare right now in this church. God saw some of you to an altar right now and says, you know what? You need my healing touch today. Maybe it's physical, emotional, spiritual. He's saying, you need me. Come right now, he says. Some of you has a broken home, a broken marriage, a broken life, whatever it may be. God said, you need me. Some of you are in a broken relationship and you don't have God as the head of your life. You know a lot about him. But you don't know him personally. You haven't done like Peter and Isaiah and Ananias and Saul. And you haven't fallen on your face before God and said, God, I'm a ruined man. I'm sinful. God, I need you. Can I tell you, today's a day of salvation for you. Today's a day of personal revival. 
Maybe you've walked away. I believe God wants to start a revival in our church. But it will never happen if you sit where you're at and you don't obey. He's calling you today. You don't have to have it all together. He does. But he's calling you. Go ahead, Pastor Matt. We're going to sing this song, and I want you to stand us. Come just as you are. And I want you to come right now. Don't wait. Don't let the enemy win today. Amen. Come on. God wants revival in our church. Would you come today? Bring your brokenness. Bring your hurts. Bring your pains. Bring your sin. The only way Satan wins is if you let him. Would you come today? You want revival, would you come? You need a fresh touch, a fresh anointing. Broken homes, broken lives, broken marriages, broken health, broken finances. Husbands, grab your wife by the hands. Dad, grab your son, grab your daughter. Grandma, grandpa, grab your children. Come on, God's not waiting today, come. If he spoke to you, come. Don't resist the spirit today, would you come? Come. morning, I just want you to keep playing for Pastor Matt there in the background for just a moment. You're sitting here today and um, you have children or you have loved ones that don't know Jesus. I want you to raise your hand. You have people that don't know Jesus that need Jesus. Lift them high. But everybody in this sanctuary, we have people that don't know Jesus. I want to challenge you. I want to see revival happen in the church. I challenge you to get on your knees. Begin to pray for revival in your own heart first. 
Would you seek and you search the face of God? And you ask Him, God, use me. Here I am, Lord, use me. Use my influence, God. I want to see revival in my life, in my family's life, in the life of my church, in my world, in my influence. God, for your kingdom. But I believe there's some of you in here this morning that you have things going on in your life and you haven't said yes to Jesus yet. There's some things you haven't surrendered to God. Some of you in here need to be saved this morning. You need to say, God, I give you complete authority of my life, complete control. God, I want you to forgive me of my sin. God, I realize I have personal sin, God. And I, I can't do anything, Father God, to, to remove it from my life. Only by the blood of Jesus. I want you to understand that this morning, church. It's only by the blood of Jesus are we saved. I don't care how much you come to church, how much you work in a church, how much you give in the church. I'm going to tell you, it's only by the blood of Jesus that we're saved this morning. We have got to live under the authority of the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not here to play games. Life's too short. I'm not here to preach things that make you feel good about yourself. The only way that you'll ever feel good about yourself is knowing that you're in the right relationship with Jesus Christ. You'll find contentment. You'll find joy. You'll find peace. You'll find hope. And I could go on, but I know we've got to end this service sometime. But I don't believe God wants to end this service right now. There's some of you still need to come to this altar this morning. I'm just going to ask you, Pastor Matt, just to play one more song. And I just want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes this morning for just one moment. If you're sitting here this morning, you said, Pastor, I feel like Isaiah. I feel like Peter. I feel like Saul. I recognize that when I see the glory of God that I've got sin in my life right now. And I need forgiveness of my personal sin. I want you to be honest and raise your hand. Everybody right now. Amen. All around this church, raise your hand. You need God right now in your life. This altar is open if you want to come pray. But right now I challenge you just to ask God for forgiveness. Let's sing this song through one time. the Lord. Amen. God answers prayer, doesn't he? There's been some definite answers to prayer around this altar this morning. Are you rejoicing? Amen. Pastor Shannon, you was right on target. We heard what you said. We hear what God says. And we praise him for victory. Amen. Amen. I think God deserves a good hand clap, don't you? Amen. Let's give it to him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have heard you today. We have seen you high and lifted up in your church among your people. You have spoken to us. There's been victories around this altar, Lord, some that we've been praying for for a long time. 
and we give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor. And Lord, we lift you up this morning as Lord of our lives. We promise you, Lord, that we want to serve you. We want to give you our very best. We want to go. We want to be all that you want us to be. So we praise you today. Lord, we give you all the glory and all the honor. Thank you for this wonderful congregation that's come to church. Thank you for the faithfulness of our pastor with all the pressure set upon him, preaching the word of God faithfully to us this morning. God bless them. So, Lord, we go from this place today rejoicing. We go with our shoulders high and our head lifted up and giving you all the praise, Lord. We want you to be Lord of our lives. We want you to be Lord of everything. And we give you that today. Thank you for what we've heard. Thank you for what we've seen. Thank you for what we feel. Thank you, Lord, for what we can expect you to do for us in the future. And we give you all the praise, honor, and glory in the wonderful, precious, holy name of Jesus. And all of God's people said what? Amen. 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 God bless you. And I know you can't hug up too much, but you can do whatever. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming to church. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, spread the living water.